So, thank you again for coming. I'm Adam Roberts, and I'm a professor in the English department, and I'm here because I write science fiction, so I've written one of the stories in this collection. And what I'm going to do in a little bit is read a bit of the story. I won't read the whole thing, because that would spoil it. Also, it would go on far too long. And then I'm, I'm hand you over to, to Stuart, for Stuart Bugert, who can introduce himself. So, I'm Stuart Bugert. I'm a professor of physics. And I'm the scientific foil to, the, to one of the stories, so discussing the science that goes into those stories. And, and trying to discuss it in a way which is interesting, positive, to, to, to explain the underlying concepts in those stories. And so myself and Adam have discussed various things along these lines uh, over yeah. the years, yeah. discussed uh, bits of physics and science and as they, go, as, as they appear in literature and short stories and novels. And so Thought X is a collection of short stories which all uh, have uh, uh, some discussion from uh, physicists, scientists, or philosophers. And so to, to have a collaboration between those two individuals. I actually collaborated with somebody else, not Adam. And no. Adam collaborated with a, another physicist. So he was given the option and he said, no, anybody no. <laughs> but that guy, I can't bear him if I have to stand up. No, it would be far too convenient just to walk across campus. <clears throat> so this is, this is the third anthology that Comma Press have produced where they have commissioned original short fiction from writers and told the writers to collaborate with scientists. And I, I've been in all three of them, which is quite an achievement, I think. That's either a, a mark of my expertise and excellence as a writer or else just the way that the editor, Ra Page, gets a bit desperate sometimes when he's thinking, who else can we, you know, at short notice sometimes to uh, get down, write science fiction, to speak to another scientist. So really what we're going to do, after I've read a little bit of the story and after Stuart, Stuart's talked a little bit about the paradoxes and the thought experiments, is try and start a conversation about that, that crossover between fiction and science, which is, of course, at the heart of science fiction, which is what I love, because although I may look like a, a balding man in his 50s, I'm actually 14 years old and just as excited about Star Wars now as I was when it was very first released. So I'm here to represent fiction and Stuart's here to represent science and fact and from, just from that, straight away, you can see that science is younger and better looking than fiction, but fiction has this advantage. Uh, his shoes are more expensive. And uh, so is his shirt, if we're honest. But that's, you know, it's, it's, it swings and roundabouts, really. It's the way these things play off against one another. Should I read a little bit of the story? I've said that like that's a, a question. <laughs> no! no! We don't want to hear that. What a load of nonsense. I will read a bit of the story. Um, and I'll say something about the... Uh, so the, the premise for this collection, this is, as I say, is the third one, is uh, a, a set of famous scientific thought experiments and paradoxes. And the paradox that I got uh, uh, with joy uh, in my heart, and not at all because all the other paradoxes had already been snaffled by <laughs> the more famous authors, was Olber's paradox. Now, you know about Olber's paradox. I'm not going to insult you by saying you don't know about Olber's paradox. You've probably written original fiction exploring the possibilities of Olber's paradox yourself. You may have published it and made films out of it? I don't know. Who am I to say that you haven't? Olber was a German astronomer from the late 18th and early 19th century, and his first name was Heinrich. And he thought, well, if the universe is infinite, then there will be stars in every direction. Wherever we look, our sight line should end on a star. So we shouldn't look at the night sky and see it black. We should see light everywhere. He thought, even if there are dust clouds obscuring the light, even if there are particles and, and planets getting in the way of the light, in an infinite universe, the light would be constantly falling on those dust particles and would heat them up until they incandesced and everything would be bright. So the fact that when we look up at the night sky, it is mostly dark, that, says Olber, proves that the universe is not infinite. He, he was working in, in the 1820s and the 1830s with the premise that the universe was simply uh, as it has always been, what they call the steady state theory of the universe. And now physicists, I think entirely arbitrarily and for no real reason, just because they think it's a nice idea, tell us that the universe was not a steady state, that it originated sometime in the past with a big bang and that it has been expanding ever since. And it's that expansion 
unless I'm wrong, that is the solution to Olber's paradox. That yeah. there hasn't been time for the light from all the stars in what may or may not be an infinite universe to have reached us. Exactly. So if the, if the universe was infinite in extent, then Adam would be right, and his story uh, would be based on scientific fact. And it isn't an arbitrary decision <laughs> that the, the, the universe is expanding. You have no idea. You <laughs> it's based on, on, on 100 years of measurement and, uh, and yeah. experiment and obs fake well, observation. Fake news. Fake, fake, fake news, <laughs> fake, just like, fake in news. my opinion. No, it's just exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so For all we know, all the stars are shrinking, and that's why they seem to be getting further apart. You can't prove they're not. Yeah, OK, that, it, that doesn't change. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually change the solution to Olber's paradox uh, in some sense. Actually, yeah. It doesn't. So if you arbitrarily say everything, you know, all the material is shrinking and the universe is staying the same size, it still, it still gives us the same result. But the point is that we, are in dis we can be in disconnected parts of the universe. Mm. And we can be in a bubble, and no information from a certain distance away can reach us. So, so even though the universe uh, it might be infinite, we see it's expanding, and there are parts, very distant parts of this universe, which we're basically totally disconnected from. You can imagine little bubbles in uh, soap. So one bubble is its own little volume, and it's completely disconnected from another piece of the universe. It's, it's what we call causally disconnected. So light can't travel from there. It can't heat up a piece of, piece mm -hmm. of uh, planet or star, and so it would never reach us. And so maybe there are other bits of universe, but they're just inaccessible to us. And so although it's expanding, it's disconnected. OK. So, so that's the, the situation I find myself in. So I think, well, OK, I'm going to write a short story about this. I'm not going to write a, a scientific disquisition. But if I speak to my scientist, uh, Dr. Sarah Bridal at Jodrell, Jodrell Bank, she tells me there is no paradox. It has been solved. And any ideas I come up with to try and make it interesting in a kind of fictional <laughs> sense, she says, no, no, that's, that's not right. So I say, well, what about you know, dark matter and dark energy? That's a huge amount of the universe is, is this stuff that's called dark matter and dark energy because nobody really knows what it is. They know it's there, but they don't know quite what it is. It's not ordinary matter. Is that, does that have something to do with the, the reason why so much of the light of the universe isn't reaching us? And she said, no, no that's, that's got nothing to do with it. That's, uh, so I think, well, you've got to give me some leeway here. I've got to have something to work with. So I ended up writing a story uh, which I called Keep It Dark, um, because I like to, to name my stories after Genesis tracks, if I possibly can, in which, uh, as a writer, rather than as a scientist, which I'm not a scientist, um, because science, it's all fake news. We've established that. Well, that's a bombshell we take away from the evening. It's, it's all made up. There's no evidence one way or the other, as far as we can see. Um, as, a, as a creative writer, I'm interested in... Uh, if, if Olber had been right... And if there, there should be a, a, a universe of light everywhere we look, why is there so much darkness? That has interesting metaphorical uh, kind of potential you know, for a writer. There are ways in which that becomes eloquent about us as human beings, about what we can say. The um, epigraph to Thomas Pynchon's Against the Day, which is my favourite Pynchon novel, actually. Everyone likes Gravity's Rainbow, but I think Against the Day is, is really his masterpiece. It's his most science fictional novel. Huge novel set around 1900. And he starts with a little epigraph. The epigraph is, um, it's always night, or we wouldn't need the light. And he's interested in that sense that we live in a kind of blindness, that we don't really understand what's going on, and that the tools that are available to science, and that people like Stuart deploy, uh, they, they don't really provide the kind of answers that we need. So I ended up writing a story about blindness and about faith and about astronomy and observation. And I'll read a little bit. I'll read the beginning of it. and I won't read all the way through to the end of it. Um, so I start with a little epigraph of my own. <coughs> my epigraph is from Vladimir Nabokov, the, the, the Russian writer, uh, from a letter that he wrote to his wife. And this is what he said in his letter. I need so little, a bottle of ink, a speck of sun on the floor, and you, which is very sweet. Um, it's not true, because he also needs oxygen, and uh, he probably needs clothes. It may be cold where he's working. He needs to eat and drink. But no, you see his point, that um, a bottle of ink, 
a speck of sun on the floor and you. He needs to express himself as a writer. He needs the beauty of sunlight, and he needs the love of his life, who is his wife. But I also like that quotation because the way Nabokov, who was a poet as well as a prose writer, balances out the blackness of the ink with the illumination of the light. So I set my story in uh, Australia, in the northern portion of Australia, which is a place I've never been to. So I did some research, which is I went on to Facebook, I believe it's called, and I messaged one of my Australian friends, who's a writer called James Bradley, and I said, what do you call tarmac over there? And he went, we call it asphalt. I said, is it really, it's kind of jungly up north, isn't it, in your, he said, yeah, it is. So I thought, well, fair enough, that'll do me. <clears throat> on the drive over, they had a conversation about darkness. Kay said, the proportions, I won't do Australian accents, that really would be adding insult to injury. I could try, should I try Australia? No, quite right. Uh, the proportions in the actual universe are 4.9% ordinary matter, 26.8% dark matter, and 68.3% dark energy. And actually, the majority of ordinary matter in the cosmos is also dark, since the stars that we see in the nebulas and the other bright stuff is only about a tenth of the regular mass of everything. And Broom replied, fascinating, fascinating. So visible matter is one-tenth of 5% of the whole picture, one-tenth of one-twentieth. And Kay said, yes. How wonderful that you have all these precise numbers at your fingertips. It's my job. Broom thought about it for a while. He never sounded more like a preacher than when he replied, so when God said, let there be light, he was actually saying, let there be a half of 1% light. And as for the rest, keep it dark. Hmm, said Kay, navigating the car through a tricky turn off the asphalt and onto an overgrown gravel track. Asphalt, you see. You see, that's, that's not what I wouldn't written that if it's set in England. But that's the kind of detailed research. That's sort of the really hard work of being a writer. I spent, ooh, six or seven minutes on Facebook that morning. Doesn't that make you wonder, Broom said, staring through the passenger's window with his sightless eyes, if we've got it the wrong way round. The universe is not a blaze of light in the darkness, a big bang, a frame fitted for us to clamber upon. The universe is dark, and it has always been dark. And the stuff we're made out of is a vanishingly rare aberration. Spoken, said Kay, like a blind man. They'd gone as far as the D-Max could take them, deep into the wilderness. Kay parked up and helped Broom out. Not much further, she told him. I can see the scope. They were on a low, broad ridge. To their left, the land dropped towards a lake. A little way ahead, to the right, a lesser slope revealed the discarded giant bra cup of the telescope in amongst all the heavy greenery. The air was hot as steam, sweat kibbling the skin of the back like insect bites, the scalp moist and itchy, skin rashing up under arms and between breasts, a sheer horrible devilry of heat. Kay took Broom's hand and led him. Off we trot, she said. The gates were fuzzed with brambles, jammed ajar by weeds. It was a tight squeeze getting through, down into the underworld, golden bough in hand. Gold shines only when light shines upon it. Off we trot, Kay said again, but they walked slowly rather than, rather, picking their way through the undergrowth. There were as many mosquitoes as there were stars in the sky, and they swirled in great galaxies of dust motes, darkness over the skein of the lake, sank down as a cloud into the fern-littered valley. They were monstrously curious about Kay's neck and face and arms. Tufts of grass, Mohican sprouted, an ancient tree put its many elbows out at awkward angles. A chubby spider was fiddling with its web. It looked like it was beckoning to them. A minute brought them to the dish. The squat tower was chained up with vines like an escapologist's trunk, an oval pond of white scum nestled in the concavity. Underneath, swallows had built their nests out of dirt and moss and discarded wiring. A congregation of yawning tribbles Wow, said Kay, that's some disrepair. Well, you didn't expect it to be pristine, panted Broom. No, but, said Kay, well, but, wow. Broom put his head back, and his unseeing eyes did their freaky wiggle-wiggle thing. I can hear birdsong, he said. 
welcome swallows, lots of them. Me, mostly I can hear mozzies, distant high-pitched droning, a pygmy bagpipe. She was far from convinced that the cream was working. Let's get inside. The old accommodation consisted of three rectangular prefabs and a generator surrounded by a metal fence. The buildings were a gray that was the color of rain. The windows were all marked with smallpox patterns of dust. Kay couldn't see which one Lorenzini was staying in, but they were all deserted. Here was a black water tank. It plinked like a tapped bell as insects landed on the drum skin surface of the water it contained. Here were fat gum trees with intricately fractured bark, saddlebags of greenery. And here was a tent and Lorenzini opening the flap like a surgeon peeling back skin and out he stepped looking like a zombie, but waving to them cheerily. You came, you came, you came, he said, and wrapped his boa arms constrictingly around Kay's body and kissed her cheek. He was weeping. That wasn't a good sign. Why are you in a tent, Law? Kay asked. Wouldn't one of the huts have served? Don't laugh, he replied gravely, but I've lined the inside with foil. Wow, she said. Sure, said Lorenzini, sure. Better than a hat. Dear Lord, my friend, said Broom, looking a yard to the left of Lorenzini and laughing. You've got off your trolley, all alone out here, as fruity as a cake. Rude, said Lorenzini. He sounded actually hurt. You're underweight, Law, said Kay. Mate, we need to get you back to civilization. Sure, sure, I know, I know. And you, Batman, how he lunged forward and threw his arms around Broom and hugged him tight. And Broom kept laughing. And then Lorenzini was saying, you're right, of course, you're right. You're my only friends in the whole goddamn country. Sorry, Rev. You have the arms of a gibbon, said Broom, extricating himself, and something of the same smell. Can we go inside? This cream isn't keeping these gobbling monsters off my skin, I think. And now Lorenzini was wiping the tears out of his eyes with grimy fingers. You've got to see my data first, he said, and took dainty hold of Kay's elbow, as a man might hold an uncooked egg with only the tips of his fingers. Back up the overgrown path he led them, past the three empty accommodation prefabs and back towards the dish. You got data out of that? Kay asked. Paradox busting data, said Lorenzini with pride. But then he was weeping again. And the lines in his face were deep and clear, like the cracks in the ice on the surface of Saturn's moon Europa. He really did not look well. Mate, I know radio telescopes, said Kay, and this is not a functioning radio telescope. Well, it doesn't function as a conventional radio telescope, he mumbled but it still takes in data. Come inside. Oh, wow, said Kay, the opposite of enthused. And she looked through the door. Nothing is supposed to smell like that. Yeah, agreed Lorenzini. Uh, there may have been some lunch-related decomposition. Hey, Rev, woohoo. I'm blind, said Broom, actually not deaf. Kay guided him towards the door. Lorenzini was gabbling on. You know Olber's paradox, right? Lorenzini felt the shift in temperature passing through the door. It was still hot, and the smell was genuinely unpleasant but it was better than the overwhelming heat of outside. Um, Lorenzini's voice was close by Broom's right ear. The paradox is how dark the night sky is. It's a paradox in three senses. For one, Olbers wasn't the guy who first formulated. That was a these are called digs a century earlier. And two, the paradox is itself. And three, I've solved it, so it's not a paradox anymore, which makes it paradoxical to call it a paradox. I don't think any of that adheres to the proper definition of the term paradox, said Kay further away. Is there a chair? Broom asked. Lorenzini guided them along the wall to a hard little seat. Um, then I'm, I'm going to stop now because I'm just going to go on and on. I'm, I just kind of love the sound of my own voice. What happens next is he explains the paradox, which apparently is not a paradox, and then he locks them inside in the room with no light, having thrown um, bleach in the eye of the woman, Kay, to blind her. And that's um, where the story then goes. But I'm going to stop there because I think I've been talking long enough. I may have been talking for hours and hours. I've lost track of where I am.